Hello and welcome to Giving Ventures, a podcast to help you grow your giving and change the world for the better. Each episode, we share innovative charitable efforts leveraging private philanthropy to solve public problems. I'm your host, Peter Lipset, Vice President at Donors Trust. This show is a product of Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor advised fund focused on helping conservative and libertarian donors of all capacities simplify, protect, and grow their giving. My colleagues and I talk with a lot of groups doing great work. This show lets us share a bit of what we learn with you so you can discover new projects for your own philanthropy. Today we're going to court, specifically the Supreme Court. You know, litigation has long been an important aspect of many conservative and libertarian organizations. We've noticed an uptick of think tanks and different groups adding legal centers to either bring cases or draft amicus briefs, and all of these complement the many public interest law firms across the country that are built to bring cases that support First Amendment, religious freedom, taxpayer protections, property rights, and all of our freedoms and liberties. All this litigation winds its way through the various levels of the American judiciary and sometimes ends up all the way at the top at the Supreme Court. Well, the common thread of the three groups we're going to hear from today is that all have or will be making arguments before the Supreme Court in this 2022-2023 term. Pacific Legal Foundation, one of the country's oldest libertarian public interest law groups, is no stranger to arguing before the high court, while our second group, New Civil Liberties Alliance, faced the justices for the first time this year. And our third group, Job Creators Network Foundation, isn't a law firm at all, but was in the right position to bring its second case up to the Supreme Court. These are three great groups doing exciting work, not just the timely, headline-grabbing work of arguing before the Supreme Court, but more broadly, in all they do. So let's hear about it. Over the past several years, no First Amendment public interest law firm has grown its reach as much as the Pacific Legal Foundation. Founded back in 1973, the organization has become a real household name in liberty circles over the the past decade, uh, and has had a particularly strong track record at the Supreme Court level, as we will hear I am happy to be joined by Stephen Anderson, PLF's president and CEO since 2016. Stephen, let's start broadly. Uh, tell us a little bit about what PLF is and maybe why the Pacific part of the name may lead us to think that your work is a little narrower than it really is. Sure. Pacific Legal Foundation is a public interest law firm that litigates to vindicate our constitutional rights uh, and to ensure that uh, individual liberty flourishes around the country. We were started back in the early 1970s, uh, really the prototype of uh, the public interest law firms that we see today. Um, We were the first uh, kind of broad spectrum public interest law firm litigating for uh, the Constitution. And we grew out of uh, a situation that was happening in California in the early 1970s when then Governor Ronald Reagan was engaging in welfare reform. And... While he was going through that, he was being attacked by so-called public interest law firms, um, typically uh, of a more uh, left of center bent. Uh, There was a large scale creation of public interest firms, often called poverty firms in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And Reagan was being pummeled by these these firms. And he wondered to himself, um, and this is the apocryphal story we tell ourselves at PLF, he wondered to himself, why is there no group that's litigating cases from our kind of perspective. And that's what led to the creation of of PLF in 1973. It was was folks from that welfare reform battle. And Pacific Legal Foundation was actually not the first choice of the founders of PLF. Um, They had other names in mind, but ultimately settled on on Pacific Legal Foundation. There was no, um, I've gone through our archives as we approach our 50th anniversary in a couple of months. So I've looked at the documents that surrounded the founding of PLF. And there was no real rhyme or reason for choosing Pacific Legal Foundation other than the folks were here in California. I I like to joke uh, with folks that if if Reagan had been the governor of Kansas, we would have been founded in Topeka, right? There's nothing sacrosanct about what what we're doing here in Sacramento. But um, lo and behold, that, that became the name. And very soon after, while Pacific Legal Foundation sounds very provincial, very soon after PLF's founding in 1973, PLF opened up an office in Illinois. A couple of years after that, we had an office in, in Washington, D.C. So from the very start, 
the founders of PLF were engaging in litigation around the country. Fast forward 50 years, and we have uh, we have employees in 25 states around the country. We have litigation in more than 30 states uh, across the country. So what we aim to be at Pacific Legal Foundation, even though it sounds very Western, is um, to be the Southwest Airlines of public interest law. We want to we want the name to never reflect kind of where we are, uh, but instead to be something that when when you hear the name, you you think about the great victories we're having around the country in, in courts. Um, in, in federal courts and state courts alike. Well, and there's a bunch of these public interest law firms, libertarian leaning firms all across the country now. I mean, you used to work at Institute for Justice, which we featured back on episode 15 of the Giving Ventures podcast. And you two are probably among the largest, but there's there's so many other Southeastern legal and Mountain States legal, yada, yada, yada. Are there too many? Uh, and are there advantages to having that many kind of right leaning, libertarian leaning public interest law firms out there? I don't think there are too many. In fact, I would. I, I wish there were more. The, Leviathan is large, and there are many targets for us to to take on. And each of us does things a little bit differently. We we believe in markets, right? And and it's collaboration and cooperation. But you know, in, in some sense, there's also competition, right? We we all want to to do really well because we know that the what the end game is, and that is to to put Leviathan in his coffin. And I often say that. It doesn't matter to me whether it's IJ or Fire or ADF or Beckett or whomever it is puts the last nail on Viathan's coffin. We'll be there celebrating because it means that we've we've done our jobs. You know, we all do things differently. At PLF, we have a, a kind of a swashbuckler mentality. We litigate in various courts around the country, but and, and, and we we also litigate issues that are different than other other places. So we really and truly want a thousand flowers to bloom. We want as many groups out there to litigate for liberty as as possible because, you know, just to take one example, the the budget for the United States Department of Justice is a billion dollars, right? And if you combined every one of the public interest law uh, law firms that are libertarian leaning, you, you wouldn't approach even close to that billion dollars. And that's just the Department of Justice, right? You have all the agencies and then you have the state level Departments of Justice and their agencies. So uh, it's an uphill battle, but w- so that's that's why I, I never say that there are too many because um, we need more than we have now. Well, let's turn to the Supreme Court. You know, PLF has had a unique run of success. You've had 16 cases decided by the court, I believe, 14 wins, two losses, and still have two pending, which we'll kind of get to. Give us a sense of what it costs to take a case to the Supreme Court and how do you characterize, how do you assess that return on investment? Because it's not cheap. No, it can. It, if you take things from the trial court level, it will probably cost about a million dollars, all told, to bring a case from the trial court all the way to the Supreme Court. Not all of our cases have gone, and, and that's over the lifetime of the case, right? Not all of our cases are brought from trial court to the Supreme Court. Uh, some of our cases are brought from the appellate courts. We'll take them over on appeal. Uh, but but more than the the money is a it's the it's the time investment. These cases take many many years to get to the Supreme Court, and beyond the cases, the issues take even longer to get before the court. So, what it means for organizations like ours is you have to have a very over the horizon perspective about how change is going to happen. Right? It's not going to be the next Congress or the next election. Um, what you have to wait is for the judiciary to take the case and for the um, the issue to come out your way. We, we've we've hit on something at the Supreme Court to go back to your to the earlier conversation about our name. When I came to PLF, I was adamant we needed to change our name because it was too too parochial. It was just it, it conjured up images of the West, and um, I thought that was not good for our brand. As it turns out, we have a very keen brand recognition at the Supreme Court. They, they talk about us by name, and we were loath to change that given the equity that we had built up at that point in, in 44 years of our existence. So we, you know, we, we, we stuck with the name. But you know, these, these issues can take a decade or more, or more than a decade to get to the Supreme Court. And we've, because we've hit on something at the Supreme Court, we've had 16 in our, or 18 in our history, two, two of those are pending. Ten of our cases have happened in the last seven years. So we've we've accelerated the pace at which we're getting before the court. And in a time when the court is taking 
in decreasing number of cases. The last couple of years, they've taken around 60 cases. Um, and when they're getting eight or 9,000 petitions a year to have one or this, this term to have two of our cases, there is a real testament to the, to the long-term vision we have in getting our cases to the court. Let's talk about those cases briefly in the in the last couple of minutes here. You actually had the very first case that the Supreme Court heard this term in second versus EPA. Give us the the quick high level view of what that case is. Mike and Chantel Sackett have been trying for 15 years to build a house in rural Idaho, but the uh, EPA says that they have water on their property that's subject to the federal court's jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. And, and as a result, they haven't built anything there uh, in those 15 years. The Sacketts are part of a club you don't want to be a part of, and that's repeat uh, appearances before the Supreme Court. We won their case 10 years ago, which was on the issue of just whether they could sue the EPA in the first place. And we were back in October for Justice Jackson's first argument uh, as to the size and scope of the Clean Water Act. Just what does waters of the United States mean under the Clean Water Act? Just how much jurisdiction does the federal government have over our property? And should we win this case, and we're you know very hopeful that we will given the makeup of the court, this will open up millions and millions of acres of property across the country for development, allowing people like the Sacketts to build a simple house like they've wanted to for the past 15 years. That's awesome. And, you know, you also had Wilkins versus United States of America, which sounds a little bit like that first case of the Sacketts where, where they're just trying to get the right to be able to, to sue, uh, as I understand it. And the only reason I understand it even a little bit is because you've got a great three-minute video with your plaintiff, Will Wilkins, uh, telling his story. And we'll put the link to that in the notes. So you make a lot of those types of videos. You do a lot with multimedia. Uh, it's not necessarily what you would think a law firm would be doing. So... What's the value in that? Uh, you're not going to sway the justices with a three-minute video, I'm guessing. So what's the value in, in taking the time and expense to put those videos together? When I describe what PLF does, I, I say we engage in social change, not, not legal change. I, we engage in social change, and this is part and parcel. The work we do with communications and, and, and research and policy, those are all complementing the litigation work we do because we want to see the world look a certain way when we're done with a with with our work. And all of those things help seed uh, seed the ground for what we want to see in the future. You know, whether, it, whether or not it changes a justice's mind, we, we'll probably never know. But what it does is it educates people about the importance of the ideas that we're fighting for. And ultimately, that's the thing that's going to win in the end. It's not, it's not going to be what justices say in Washington, D.C. It's what people are thinking in their in their hearts and minds. Yeah, you've got the hearts and minds bat battle, which is separate from what actually happens in the court. I mean, you were at IJ when the Kelo decision came down and you lost at the court, but you won in the, the hearts and minds of people because of the story they put out and you all are doing the same thing. I, th I think what PLF is doing is great and awesome and uh, kudos to you for the hard work and best of luck in these two decisions uh, that you have coming out to the to the Supreme Court. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Peter, so much. We appreciate it. Well, unlike Pacific Legal, our next public interest law firm focuses solely on fighting the administrative state. The new Civil Liberties Alliance, or NCLA, is a newer group on the scene, founded just over five years ago in 2017. Its president and general counsel, Mark Chenoweth, joins me to unpack what NCLA is up to these days and tell us about the group's first appearance at the U.S. Supreme Court this past November. So, Mark, thanks for joining me. Good to be with you, Peter. Mark, let's start by unpacking what it means by this this term of administrative state and then what that means for NCLA's focus. Sure. So the administrative state is just that collection of alphabet soup agencies uh, of the federal government uh, that we're all familiar with, hopefully not too familiar with, uh, because they, they they have started to work their way into the you know every nook and cranny uh, of our lives, as we just saw this this uh, earlier this month with the whole controversy over gas stoves that all of a sudden no one knew gas stoves were a, were a problem and now the Consumer Product Safety Commission is talking about potentially banning them. So that, that's, that's what we mean by the administrative state. It's not Congress. It's not even necessarily the White House, but it's all of these sometimes independent agencies or sometimes just federal executive agencies that at least in theory are under the president's control. That would seem to be a pretty broad swath of organizations that you have to keep your eye on. Uh, it's a tremendously broad swath of organizations, and they are up to no good uh, every day. So it's uh, 
it's a full-time job and and our focus entirely on the administrative state still means we have a pretty broad uh, set of, of things that we're keeping an eye on yeah and so what what all does get encompassed i mean it's it's rulemaking it's the federal register it's 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 what what all is encompassed in that sure so you know what what we're really focused on is is uh, seven different areas and we've We've, fo- we, we've picked these areas because we think they're the places where unlawful administrative power uh, is really uh, exercised the most often to violate people's civil liberties. And that's what we're concerned about. So we're not necessarily jumping in uh, if we think that a rule doesn't cost benefit balance or that kind of thing. And there are other groups that do that. That's, that's worth doing. But we're really focused uh, on the question of the violation of people's civil liberties. And that happens when administrative agencies uh, don't follow the Constitution. And so we're, we're keen on putting constitutional constraints around what uh, administrative uh, agencies do. So I, I mentioned there's seven areas. Uh, those are in, in, in no particular order. Uh, we have a set of First Amendment cases where we push back against administrative bans or mandates on speech. Our second category is, is cases uh, that we think of as sort of scope of authority cases where agencies may be uh, exceeding the power that Congress has given them under their statutory authorities. Our third category is judicial deference cases, where we, we find that agencies are uh, seeking deference from the courts for their uh, questionable interpretations of their uh, statutory authority. And we push back against uh, many different kinds of, of judicial uh, deference. People have heard of Chevron deference sometimes, because that's the sort of the most notorious. But there's over a dozen different kinds of deference that are problematic. Our fourth uh, category is sort of Fourth Amendment cases, administrative searches that are done without warrants and without the approval of judges. Our fifth category is due process, which can mean uh, both administrative adjudications without a, without a jury trial, for example. Uh, it can also mean things like the on, on-campus kangaroo courts that we see in the Title IX uh, context. Our sixth category is uh, guidance abuse, where agencies try to treat guidance that they put out as somehow binding uh, on, uh, on people, where it's not. It's not law. It's not binding, but they try to pretend like it is sometimes. And then our last category is conditions on spending, where we see agencies will take a law that Congress has passed, and they'll try to add conditions to it that are legal. Tr- they try to make them legal binding conditions that they don't have any authority uh, to add to what uh, Congress has done. So those are the seven categories that we're looking at. You know, I feel like sometimes the term administrative state gets thrown out there as this boogeyman on the right, uh, and, you know, capital A, capital S, administrative state. Sure. Is that fair? I mean, is that, am I looking at it wrong? Or is it really as bad as all that? I think it's as bad as all that. I mean, what we've seen lately is, uh, and when I say lately, I'm really talking about, you know, going back 15 or 20 years, but the administrative state uh, has become unmoored from uh, from the legal authority uh, t- to do things. And that's that's part of the problem. And maybe that's because Congress has, has stepped back and stopped legislating. And so there's this theory, at least uh, on the left, that, well, if Congress isn't going to do something about it, then you know, an agency needs to step in and do something. Or President Obama talked about, uh, you know, after the Republicans took over the House uh, in 2010, he said, well, I still have a pen and a phone, uh, as, as though the Constitution has a pen and phone clause for presidential authority, which it, which it does not. Uh, and, and there were jokes about uh, you know, the use of executive orders and, uh, and thing. I think there was even a Saturday Night Live skit on executive orders sort of mocking the old... Uh, uh, schoolhouse rock version of of I'm just a bill, but you know the executive order is well I just happen uh, <laughs> was sort of the the thing that the executive order was saying, and so we have seen a greater abuse happen uh, from that, and, and it's really part of the problem is a complete lack of accountability. These aren't elected people who are doing these things, and I think that's part of what bugs people. It's also part of what makes it difficult to push back, and so we really have to push back through the courts, and that's why we. Uh, bring as much original litigation as we do at the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Well, let's talk about one of those. On November 7th, NCLA faced the bench at the Supreme Court for the very first time. You faced plenty of other courts in your five-year history, but first time at the Supreme Court with SEC versus Cochran. Tell us about that case and what the stakes are and, and kind of what the outlook is for it. 
Sure. So we were very excited about that. It's very unusual for an organization that's uh, uh, you know, barely five years old, really been litigating for just over four years at the time that the Supreme Court uh, uh, heard this case. And the, the issue in, in Cochran, it, distilled down to its essence, is whether or not someone who is uh, undergoing an enforcement proceeding at an administrative agency has to go all the way through that proceeding before they can raise constitutional objections uh, to what the tribunal uh, is doing. So in this case, our client, Michelle Cochran, uh, believed she's already been through this administrative process at the SCC once. It got thrown out after a case uh, at the Supreme Court called Lucia, uh, where the Supreme Court decided that the administrative law judges at the SEC had been unconstitutionally appointed. And so she had to go back and start over again. And she said, well, wait a minute, if you're going to make me start over again, there's another problem with the judges uh, at the, uh, the administrative law judges at the SEC, which is that they're protected by multiple layers of, of protection from removal by the president. That's also unconstitutional. And so you're going to make me go through this whole process again. I'm going to raise this issue at the end. I'm going to win. And then what? I'm going to have to go through this a third time? No, thank you. So I need to be able to raise my constitutional objection now up front. And uh, after, after some, some unsuccessful uh, efforts in the district court and with a, a panel at the Fifth Circuit, the en banc uh, court uh, of the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Fifth Circuit ruled in her favor uh, on that question and said that there is jurisdiction in federal district court uh, to hear uh, those sorts of constitutional objections uh, to the tribunal. And that's the SEC appealed that case to the Supreme Court and that's the case that the Supreme Court heard on uh, November 7th. As for the prospects, we feel pretty good about it. The oral argument uh, went well, and we think that the court is predisposed to decide that the Fifth Circuit got this one right, that there is jurisdiction uh, in federal district court. And the, the question may be exactly what kinds of cases can you bring, because the justices were pretty clear that they don't want to see every quibble over an evidentiary ruling by an ALJ turn into a federal uh, case. So they're going to want to draw the line uh, somewhere. But I think that this particular issue is pretty far on one side of the line. So I, I think that Michelle uh, Cochran will prevail here. That's great. That's awesome. Um, well, you know, not every case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and certainly plenty of your your cases are working at the lower courts. Any other particular success you want to note or, or things coming down the pike that are worth worth highlighting? Well, the biggest recent success is another one from the en banc Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which uh, which we have a particular affinity for. Uh, but that's uh, a case called Cargill uh, v. Garland. And this is a bump stock ban case. And but, you know, folks might who haven't been following this closely might think this case uh, is about gun control or about the Second Amendment. And it's really it's really not about the Second Amendment. Uh, NCLA does not challenge whether or not Congress could ban bump stocks. What we have said is the ATF can't ban bump stocks. It can't reinterpret a 1986 statute that banned machine guns in a way that says, well, you know, bump stocks are machine guns. Well, first of all, they're not uh, machine guns, and we could talk about that statutory argument. But the bigger question is, ATF just doesn't have the authority uh, to do that. If you're going to to do something that would that would turn uh, you know, half a million people into felons overnight, that really needs to come from Congress. Congress needs to be the one to write the criminal laws. That's the responsibility Congress is given in the Constitution, not the executive branch. And if the executive branch both gets to write the law and prosecute the law, well, then you, you don't have a separation of powers uh, anymore. So that's a problem uh, as well. And we were very pleased, 13 to 3 vote with judges appointed uh, by uh, by administrations of both political parties uh, in the majority uh, decided that, that we were right, that, uh, that the statute does not ban, the, the machine gun ban statute does not cover bump stocks and that Congress needs to be the one uh, to do this if, if a ban is going to, to take place. So that created a split with three other circuit courts, the, the Sixth Circuit, the Tenth Circuit, and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So we suspect that the Department of Justice will appeal this case uh, to the Supreme Court and that the court will agree to hear the case uh, given that uh, circuit split. Uh, but for right now, the case is just in the Fifth Circuit, so it covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. So more to come on that one. That's great. I mean, so much of this seems to 
boil back down to people or to, to the different branches of government staying in their lane and people uh, respecting the citizens out there and their rights. So I'm glad that NCLA is out there fighting this fight on our behalf. Oh, it's, it's terrific. We have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, does take a lot of, uh, of time and effort and resources and, of course, uh, very brave clients who are willing to stick their necks out and, and stand up uh, to the awesome power of the federal government. Uh, and so we're very thankful for the, the clients who, who work with us and allow us to, uh, uh, to push back against this unlawful use of administrative power. Amen. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. In politics, you often hear the trope about a politician who will stick up for the little guy. Well, what about little businesses? Who is defending the incredible number of small businesses that are the true engine of America? Well, that's what Job Creators Network Foundation is meant to do. Job Creators Network Foundation and its sister organization, Job Creators Network, amplify the voice of the small business community in speaking up for free markets and the consequences of overtaxation, overregulation, and government overreach. Elaine Parker is president of Job Creators Network Foundation and joins me to talk about the work. Hello, Elaine. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Job Creators Network Foundation is the outlier on this episode because you're not a nonprofit law firm. Uh, But in December, you learned that you had a suit uh, regarding the student loan bailout that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, let's talk a little bit big picture about JCN Foundation. Uh, What are you doing to help small businesses? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, uh, Peter. Uh, The Job Creators Network Foundation was founded in 2010, and we were founded to advocate on behalf of small businesses for lower taxes, less regulations, um, and pro-growth policies in general. And, And the way we do that is really by educating small business owners about how they can really make a difference when it comes to the public policy debate. And that's by getting out there and speaking in in the media and speaking in their communities about how basically bad policy can prevent them from growing and and thriving. And and then we amplify that voice. So we work with them to um, author op-eds and then get them placed and then get them speaking out in radio and TV and sharing those stories. Unfortunately, conservatives often focus on Um, the numbers, the statistics, the income statements um, when it comes to policy discussions. We think it's important to share the real stories of how a small business is uh, is not able to grow or expand or create more jobs as a result of specific policies. And we think that making those ties um, for the American public and for legislators um, is very helpful in helping them understand how to help small businesses. One of the ways you do that is with some polling that you all do, which I think is really interesting. It's not something I think a lot of other folks are doing in terms of polling the small business community and really understanding what their concerns are. So as we record this, January 2023, what are the big issues for small businesses? Yeah, so we do a monthly small business poll. We call it the uh, JCNF Small Business IQ Poll of uh, small business owners nationally. It's conducted by um, two very well-known pollsters, Scott Rasmussen and John McLaughlin, who are actually competitors um, but we brought them together to work as a team because we felt like their both their point of views was going to be very important um, in this type of work and in this type of poll of small business owners. Um, so we track a small business um, optimism index, which we call the SBIQ, the Small Business Intelligence Quotient, which measures how businesses feel about the economy and their, their business overall. Um, and we track that every month. Um, and then we also have leave some flexibility to... Um, track questions from small business owners uh, that are within the news cycle um, and find out how they're feeling about different issues. So our December um, poll actually just came in about a week ago. And um, some of the, I'll just give you a couple of of statistics just to chew on for a little bit. 66% of small business owners have a negative view of the economy right now. 55% think it's getting worse. Half think we're in a recession. And the biggest issue that they're facing Um, It continues to be inflation. Um, And 65% of our small businesses are concerned that the economic factors and the economic conditions right now could actually force them to close their businesses. Um, So every month we do this poll and we're able to share the poll with uh, the media. And we also brief the House and Senate um, small business committee members, which really helps inform their policy discussions and debates as well. So we've seen a lot of um, good opportunities there to help inform again 
um, and educate on what small the needs of small businesses are because all of these policies, inflation or high taxes, regulatory issues, they impact our small business community in a very disproportionate way um, than big businesses. They've got floors of, of lawyers and accountants to deal with all the regulatory reform. Small business owners, they're the chief cook and bottle washer many times. Um, and they just don't have time for, to deal with all the regulatory burdens that come along. And, and especially when you're increasing taxes on small businesses and, and not allowing them to put that money back into their businesses. Um, it's just such a disproportionate impact that I think it's, it's worth getting those stories out there to policymakers to hear. Yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting uh, and, and scary on some of that, that polling, particularly if businesses are looking to close their doors. All right, let, let's pivot to the Supreme Court case uh, that is going to get heard before the justices in February. Tell us about it. Tell us tell us what it is. Sure. So thank you so much for this. letting me talk about this important issue that's coming up for us and, and for the country, for that matter. Um, you know, look, it, I can make all the moral arguments to you. It's not fair uh, for people who didn't go to college. It's not fair for people who paid off their loans. We can make all of those moral arguments. But the, but the what's on the line here and has conservatives shaking in their shoes um, is huge. Because if this illegal student loan bailout is allowed to go through, it will give not only this president, but every future president a blank check without any input um, from Congress or from the American people. Um, not only does it not solve the underlying issue of high tuition, it blows up our separation of powers. Uh, we have we have three co-equal branches of government. The Congress is the one who has the power of the purse, not the president. Um, and the president doesn't have the authority to, by the magic of a, wand, a wave of a wand, uh, come up with a, a program that spends $400 billion in, in taxpayer dollars. So we filed a lawsuit in October on behalf of two plaintiffs um, in the Northern District of Texas in Fort Worth, and we were challenging the debt forgiveness program um, under the Administrative Procedures Act and arguing that the Biden administration illegally denied uh, the public its right to participate in the program's development. What they basically they didn't go through notice and comment. It also violates the what they call the major questions doctrine. Um, this is a huge program. It impacts um, the the entire country um, from an economic standpoint. And when you violate what and an agency doesn't have the right to do that, it actually has to come from Congress when it's such a big issue like this. Um, and it, they're relying on a law called the HEROES Act, which they believe gives them the authority to do it. The HEROES Act just briefly was passed in 2003. It was for our, our men and women who were going and fighting um, in the war after the 9-11 attacks. And it was to give them relief on their student debt. The, the Congress that passed that law could have never envisioned a future president using it to um, forgive the debts of 40 million people who are not at war um, overseas fighting for us. Um, it was a specific reason. And so um, we're pushing back on that. And, and fortunately for us, the judge in this case agreed with us on November 10th, um, found the program illegal. Um, actually, that that order stopped the entire program. The government could no longer take any more applications. Um, the judge, actually, the quote I love to talk about that he had in his order is, he said that this was the largest exercise of legislative power without congressional authority in the history of the United States. And of course, the government appealed immediately to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, we had a panel of three judges that unanimously rejected that appeal. Um, and just quick note, um, those judges um, were pretty, pretty bipartisanly appointed. Um, it was a Trump judge, an Obama judge, and a Bush judge. Um, and on December 12th, uh, the Supreme Court agreed to hear our case. And so we will present those arguments on the 28th, as you mentioned, of February. So on the student loan issue, there's a bunch of different groups that have attempted to bring something uh, before the court. A lot of those have gotten swatted down, hit brick walls at lower court levels. You all have reached the highest court in the land on it. Why is that? Yeah, so um, standing was the big hurdle to overcome for all of these um, cases. I think we were united in all not in all believing that they didn't have the right to do this, but you have to get up past standing um, in any litigation. And so it was a very simple argument for us. Our, our lawsuit features two plaintiffs 
who are directly harmed because the Biden administration violated the Administrative Procedures Act, as I discussed earlier, um, and deprived them of their right uh, to uh, basically share their opinions on, on the um, uh, program through notice and comment. Every American has the right um, to be heard through notice and comment. It's the only way that we can hold unelected bureaucrats responsible uh, to accountable to the American public because they're not elected. And I guess the other question that a lot of people might have on their mind is why is an organization that's focused on small businesses bringing this lawsuit around student loan forgiveness? Well, two reasons. I mean, first, this is complete government overreach. Uh, the president just doesn't have the authority to, to go into a back room and arbitrarily come up with a rule um, that decides, you know, you're in, you're out, you're getting this much, you're getting that much, and you over here, you're getting nothing. Um, that's not how our, our system works. That's not how we were set up. Um, and so we're pushing back on, on that piece of it, the government overreach. And that's, that's very important because Congress is the one who has the power of the purse. But the second reason is the economic damage that another $400, $500 billion, some have estimated as much as a trillion dollars this could cost, being put into this economy, which is already suffering incredible inflation, but the economic damage um, that it will cause and hurt our small businesses even more. Again, those are things that disproportionately hurt our small businesses, and we think it's really important to speak out on that. Um, we polled on that with our small businesses on our um, uh, SBIQ poll, and 67% uh, of our small business owners said that the taxpayers should not be held responsible um, for this bailout. We talked earlier in the episode how it isn't cheap to bring a case to the Supreme Court. Where do you all stand on the fundraising effort, effort for all of this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, this is our second go um, at, at taking a case to the Supreme Court. Last year, we um, did file and successfully make it to the Supreme Court in the um, illegal workplace vaccine mandate. And we were the, actually the first small business advocacy organization to file and then we were the first of the about three dozen cases to file to the Supreme Court. Um, so this is our second go up here. And um, we're lucky at the beginning to get some seed money from some forward thinking donors. But I'll be honest, we're certainly looking for more support. We've raised about half of what we need. Um, this is a million dollar, almost a million dollar effort. Um, it's a David and Goliath fight. Um, we have an opportunity to right a wrong here. It's a $400 billion program. Um, like I said, it's it's nearly a million dollar um, in in um, legal fees to to get to the to the end of the fight, um, but we believe we're in the right here, and and of course it's it's going to be an ROI that probably rarely exists in the donor world. The issue that's that scares conservatives the most out of all of this is what it's going to do to our constitution because it will provide a blank check for every future president if it's allowed to go forward. Well, Elaine, we wish. All of you at the Job Creators Network Foundation, luck in February as you hear these arguments and just in the ongoing battle to, to make sure our small businesses stay strong. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I've noticed a rising cynicism about the constitutional idea of checks and balances between and among our three branches of government, but I still think these checks and balances matter, and I hope you do too. The cases we heard about today illustrate the importance of having these checks because ultimately the folks being protected are people like you and me, average citizens being defended against an over-encroachment of government in our lives. Both sides of the political spectrum can be guilty of overreach. It's why cases like what Job Creators Network Foundation is bringing, fighting back against the blank check problem with the student loan bailout matter so much. Because if such actions as what the Biden administration has taken are deemed to be okay, well, that just opens the door for abuse by all parties. Since my interview with Steven Anderson took place, PLF learned that the High Court will take up a third case of the organizations this term. It will hear Tyler v. Hennepin County, stemming from a 94-year-old widow's fight to end home equity theft in Minnesota and across the nation. Uh, that's another fight that matters for everyone, because the abuse can come from anywhere, from any jurisdiction. Likewise, abuse and overreach can come from the administrative state, headed by either party, and so we're grateful that New Civil Liberties Alliance is standing firm against that growth. And as I said at the outset of the show, so many other groups use the power of litigation to maintain our freedoms. 
Buckeye Institute in Ohio and Pelican Institute in Louisiana had important wins against OSHA's mask mandates in the recent years. Americans for Prosperity Foundation and Thomas More Law Center had a big win for donor privacy at the Supreme Court. On the public interest law front, you have Institute for Justice, Southeastern Legal Foundation, Mountain States Legal Foundation, the Hamilton Lincoln Law Institute, and so many others working to carry out this fight at all levels of the judiciary. If supporting litigation is an important part of your philanthropy, or if you want it to be, then we are always happy to talk with our clients about where they can give in a way that has an impact. And if you aren't already working with Donors Trust, well, we would be happy to change that. Just reach out through our website, the phone, or email me, Tell me more at donorstrust.org. We will be back in a few weeks with another great episode featuring important work to advance liberty and prosperity for everybody. Until then, thank you for being a giver, and let's talk more soon.